all get quiet. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for the button. <laughs> It's minimized down on the It's minimized down on the task. <laughs> Yeah, we need Yeah, I said to Pastor Perrin that that picture that they showed on the slide in the early service was really fortuitous because I wondered at first where did they get that picture of the two of us uh, <laughs> presenting today. You know, <laughs> I didn't remember that we ever took a picture together, but it was taken next to the garage out there in the summer during coffee hour, and uh, somebody photoshopped my wife out of the picture. <laughs> so, there, were the, there was Pastor Karen and I getting ready for this morning. Uh, they and, was Sonia. <laughs> and since they photoshopped my wife out of that, let me tell a story about her that relates to our, our topic uh, today. Um, we used to attend a church in uh, Austin, Texas, where we lived for 23 years. And um, that um, Austin, you may guess, for example, uh, has a lot more homeless people than does Milwaukee because of weather. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you can stay out on the streets for most of the year in, in Austin. So they had a huge challenge with the homeless and many churches decided they wanted to do something about it. The church that we attended um, decided they wanted to do something about that. My wife was a part of a group that, that was um, seeking to meet with homeless people on once a week on a regular basis and talk to them about whatever their needs were and the church had a, um, a practice of giving out bus passes uh, that they could use for a certain period of time. And um, uh, I think there was something about a phone card too because the funny thing was there were no public phones anymore. Uh, and many of these people had come out of prison. And when they went in, there were still public phones. And so when they came out, there, there were none anymore. So um, the church decided that it wanted to do more and more to involve the homeless people bring them in, bring in the stranger. And um, they wanted to invite them to come to church. Uh, and so they did. And so periodically you would have someone uh, who would come to church on Sunday morning. And uh, one time, uh, a homeless person was sitting in a pew. They had wooden pews, as you will remember from some churches. And in that wooden pew, um, one homeless man one day urinated uh, accidentally all over the pew and on the floor and then it was discovered and then the elders said, well, we can't have homeless people coming here anymore. And so you, they were facing the struggle as to what to do to be, to be open to, to um, the stranger. And on the other hand, there are problems associated with being open to the stranger. And how do you deal with that? So, that kind of a question uh, lies behind some of the things we'll talk about today. And so let's go back. I'm going to do some historical uh, overview of um, the early Christian practice of welcoming the stranger. And then we're going to turn it over to Pastor Karen, who's going to involve us in the ways in which um, the church has sought down through history, perhaps more in our modern times, to reach out to people through institutions and social service agencies and what have you. <clears throat> the word itself has various meanings in various languages, and um, I thought it would be useful to settle on this one because um, we can go all the way back to the caveman and assume that perhaps there were people who got together and invited strangers into their cave. But um, <laughs> let's just talk about ways in which the uh, Greeks and the Romans and the Jews, people in the Mediterranean world, uh, invited others into their midst, especially um, 
given their ethnic backgrounds, but ultimately their Christian backgrounds. So a definition, something like a friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, and strangers is, is fairly easy to work with. Um, we can guess what it might have been like, but uh, we know nothing about that. There I am. Now, what we do know, we go back to Homer's time, for example, a poet among the Greeks, um, 8th, 8th century BC. Um, we do have documentation, and here we have um, strangers who are coming across the field with their oxen and whatever, traveling and uh, being welcomed by some uh, hospitable family. <clears throat> and so that appears on a Greek vase, um, letting us know that there was such a, a practice going all the way back to ancient times. The Greek word for hospitality is philoxenia. And we can take that apart. Philos, many of you know, is one of the Greek words for love. Uh, and uh, xenos is, is the Greek word for stranger. So love of strangers um, was the um, word that we know as hospitality. That's uh, supposed to be a picture of uh, a typical Greek uh, hostel, bringing the stranger in, and here's the host coming in with a pot of stew or something like that, and people are uh, thrown on the bed with animal hides and allowed to stay for the night, uh, something that uh, was true for ancients as well as for people who welcome the stranger today. I like this list because it shows that there was an intention, intentionality about hospitality uh, among the Greeks, for example. Uh, there was this prescription which was actually written down and uh, people would to some degree follow it. You would arrive and then you would wait at the door and then you would ask to be received. And then um, they would take you in, they would set you down, there would be food prepared and there would be an after dinner drink. Um, <coughs> that kind of a welcoming drink is still part and parcel of of some cultures today. I know in, in some countries of the Mediterranean world, when you come to a hotel or to a hostel, there'll be a, a servant or somebody standing there with a tray with some glasses on it with a welcome drink. And uh, it typically is hibiscus um, juice um, from which tea is also made. And you toss that down and you are part of the welcome uh, group. Um, then you sit down and uh, you don't have to say anything when you come to the door about, you know, I was sent here by my cousin or whatever. Uh, now you can talk about who you are. It's not important for the stranger until a certain point. You exchange some information about your background, some entertainment is provided. Um, the visitor blesses the host. Uh, in some cultures, there was a sacrifice. And at some point, then you say, uh, we'd like a bed for the night. You get the bed in the bath. And then um, the host does this kind of a thing, uh, like, oh, please stay two days, not just one. <laughs> Perfunctory. You don't need to say that, but that's part of the ritual. And then <clears throat> there are gifts which are shared. Um, and then there's the, the departure meal and, and another drink and the farewell blessing. Um, the departure omen, I'm not exactly sure what that had to do with, and the escort to the next destination. I don't know that that was always provided, but um, that's the, the typical Greek ritual. This is the only slide that for some reason or other is mysterious, <laughs> because there was a Roman inn. Underneath the Roman Forum has been excavated a, uh, an inn where strangers were brought, and there's a a stone bed, I hope they had a hide or a mattress or something on it that you could sleep on. Um, and in Latin, the word for philoxenia, the Greek word, is hospitio. So that was their practice of hospitality. And they had rules for it also, and they tended to follow 
um, the Greek ones. In both, there was an interesting connection between um, the gods. So in the Greek world, Zeus, Xenia, um, the, the Greek gods and the Roman gods, they had certain uh, aspects to them. And so uh, Zeus, Xenia was the god that dealt with, the, the portion of Zeus that dealt with strangers. And in, in the Roman world, Jupiter, the portion that dealt with strangers was hospitality, Jupiter hospitality. Uh, it was common that if you had some kind of medical problems, legal problems, the host took care of that. Um, and the practice had a, a future meaning, this whole practice of, of uh, hospitality and philoxenia, because you might meet again. So if you did, uh, here are, the Greek word was astrologos and the Latin word is tessera. You may know tessera because uh, sometimes there'll be a, a, a mosaic with little tiny pieces of glass. Those are tessera. Uh, and so if you have a tile, for example, which sometimes would be made into a floor um, pattern, uh, but you take this piece of tile and you break it. And um, of course, hopefully, it breaks with some kind of crooked lines. And then the host takes one, and the uh, beneficiary takes one. And when you meet again, should you meet again, you put those two tiles together, and if they match, you have a bond. You belonged at one time. You were friends. You were strangers who had become one. That's an interesting practice, and I think it might be interesting for us to think about how we who are interested in trying to welcome strangers could develop a modern version of that. Um, Both for the Greeks and the Romans, because we're about to distinguish this from the Christian practice, uh, gave these gifts to those who could repay. So we were typically talking about not um, women who came on their own, or the poor, or foot soldiers, or people like that. We were talking about people who were in a status that uh, allowed them to reciprocate. This is a very famous um, image, uh, an icon. Uh, Andrei Rubrov is Russian, and uh, he did this uh, of the um, three strangers who came to visit Abraham and Sarah. But Andrei Rubrov uh, and some others have thought that this, uh, these three people were the Trinity. <coughs> so in orthodoxy today, Rubrov's icon as well as many modern versions of that icon uh, assume that we've got pictures of the Trinity here. We can assume with the Abraham and Sarah story that the three strangers were in fact strangers being welcomed into their tent and cared for much in the way that, that uh, strangers um, from the ancient world would be welcomed. So um, I, I love the image. Uh, I'm not into Trinitarian theology when it comes to that image. Oops, went too far. In the Old Testament, um, this passage is worth noting when it comes to, just a minute, did I actually, no, okay. Um, this passage we know well, when an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien, the alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Um, I wanted to remember a hymn that we sang this morning, and I can't remember that line, but um, you were aliens in the land of Egypt uh, was a line that was represented in the words of that, of the poetry of a hymn we sang this morning. Um, but the truth is, when it came to the Jewish practice, comparing that with the Romans and the, and the Greeks, Jews welcomed Jews. Uh, there are a number of stories that we can think about. Uh, we had the um, story about the, the well, um, Jacob's well, and um, um, Jesus and the woman of, uh, of Sychar at the well. Um, I was just telling John that I remembered one time when my wife and I were at that well, and um, 
uh, there was a tin cup that you could lower down to the water and, and bring up, and you could sample the same water that the ancients drank. Um, and it was cold, I remember that, but I thought as I walked away, I wonder how many people spit in there. What? <laughs> that was, of course, a modern person thinking, because the ancients didn't worry about such things. Um, and when, when um, Jacob went looking for a wife, for example, the whole story about Leah and Rachel and Laban, that's a whole story about hospitality, uh, which is reaching back uh, into ways in which relatives welcome one another. Um, but there's nothing really about totally foreign uh, people. In the New Testament, um, Jesus is quite clear. When you host a dinner, do not invite your friends or brothers or relatives or rich neighbors. They may invite you in return. And then you'll be repaid. The idea is not to be repaid. But when you host a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Since they cannot repay you, you will be repaid the resurrection of the righteous. And then the other story, um, which is also Lucan, it's uh, from Acts. The jailer called for lights, rushing in. Um, he brought them. Um, some, uh, some food as we scroll down um, and um, he was told believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household so this is a, a gathering of the, of the household the oikos is the Greek word for it and at the same time he took and washed their wounds true hospitable fashion and he and the entire family were baptized that day um, while it's talking about two things really, um, hospitality, but also the way in which um, baptisms took place. And that part of it is interesting to me because um, Jeremias, a famous um, New Testament theologian in Germany, made something out of the household um, word, uh, which in Greek was oikos, uh, the household formula, that when, and there are numerous places in the New Testament where when baptisms took place, a person in their entire household was baptized, which was the man and his wife, the servants, the children, everybody was baptism, baptized. And one of the uh, arguments for infant baptism came out of those kinds of passages which talked about the oikos, the whole household, uh, being gathered in a social setting. <coughs> Uh, a couple of things about this early Christian practice as we set it over against the Greeks and the Romans and the Jews. Um, it was self-sacrificial. <coughs> we were to see Jesus in the stranger. I have a personal memory of that because when I was in high school, um, I was in a play, it was called um, Dust of the Road. And in this play, there was a, an aged husband and wife and they were gathered in some kind of a hut and the fire was burning, and it was snowing outside, and there was a knock at the door, and um, the husband and the wife ignored it. And then, uh, after a while, the knock came again. And so they said, mm, I'm not going to go out and answer that on a wintry night. And finally, the knock came again, and this time they opened it and let him in, and one discovers in this, as is true in many, many kinds of stories down through the centuries that have been told like that, that it was Jesus who was knocking and saying, just as I received you, so you receive others. Uh, Jesus, the stranger, and we then <coughs> receiving the stranger. Uh, secondly, the women were not only invited in the Christian setting, but they became the hosts. <coughs> so Mary and Martha, Lydia and Dorcas, uh, for example, um, told in, in the book of Acts, status was unimportant. You didn't have to um, represent some kind of a background in order to be welcomed and treated royally. And thirdly, uh, the Christians redefined the family, really. They moved beyond culture. So even though there were many cultures that the early Christians 
participated in. It was the Greek and the Roman culture. If you reach beyond that, there were other cultures as well. But for the early Christians, culture was not important. Um, so Christianity became the great equalizer, and a, and a word that I rather like um, is uh, it practiced radical inclusivity. Everyone could belong. Or <clears throat> it turned the world on its head. It took the cultures of the world and turned them upside down. It created a topsy-turvy world, if you will. Um, Paul says, walk of one another as Christ is welcome you. And as we know the Gospels and we know other kinds of um, uh, narrative settings in, in the Gospels, um, including lost sheep and prodigals and tax collectors, so we know that tax collectors were bad because they were Jewish people who had been hired by the Romans uh, to take their cut first of what they collected and then uh, to pass something around to the Romans that, that were expected to. Uh, or losers and misfits of all kinds. Um, that's, that's our background. And what's the result of that? So uh, from a foot washing story here, to a foot washing story today, <coughs> there is something about Christian openness, supposed to be, that says um, we might be the founders of things like hostels and hospitals from hospitality, uh, guest houses and orphanages and senior communities and hospices and social work, parish nurses, deacons, deaconesses, food pantries, free clinics. Um, there was a um, my phone goes through. Uh, there was a uh, physician who was a member of a congregation where my wife and I were in St. Charles, Illinois. And um, one time I said to him, you know, Christians really founded hospitals. Nonsense, he said. That's not true. Well, it is true. If you want to look up where hospitals came from, hospitality, um, there were Greek physicians in the ancient world, for example, but the concept of bringing people together and caring for them, uh, a famous example is that once um, Constantine made it possible for Christians to erect their own churches, um, the, um, the rules for a cathedral in a city, which was uh, a church which had a bishop, was that you always had to have, along with a cathedral, a hospital, a way to care for the sick, because you needed to reach out to the stranger who was physically troubled in some way. So hospitals began with Christian outreach, as did many, many other things which are part of our culture today. Now, where do we go with that, and what happened to it all? Uh, well, I think Pastor Karen wants to take us on a journey into that kind of a discussion uh, as to where did it go and does it still exist and are we in some way responsible for making it happen and how? I'm queued up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Uh, I know that these are real quick overviews, just getting your um, thought process going, but... Um, not only is there this biblical mandate, but as you're describing this um, practice for like 300 years of the community gathering in the home as the place of hospitality and worship and, and community, and now, you know, what happens after now Constantine, the church is legal. Um, we see hospitality will move from um, the church to the monastery to the bishop's house to, uh, and then what happens uh, as Christians um, come to um, America? So my section, I just zeroed in on a conversation around um, the institutions, where are we today, and, and the institutions that have provided the hospitality right in our own neighborhood. Um, so my presentation is coming as neither a historian or even a local, but just a curious uh, internet searcher. <laughs> so um, I'm hoping to take about 20 minutes and then leave the, the last um, 10 minutes for you to offer your comments, questions, and corrections um, as we talk about history of um, 
what's going on with Lutherans. So 1948, Wisconsin becomes a state. Now, um, the Missouri Synod claims the first German Lutherans arrived in 19, 1838 and organized the state's first Lutheran church, Trinity Lutheran Church in Freestadt. Anybody know what part of Wisconsin that is? Oh, Anne, I saw your hand go up first. It's right by um, Beanville and Mequon. There you go. Okay. That's and they say Freistadt. Thank you. <laughs> as you. As I will admit, my origins come from uh, the western Racine County where the first Norwegian Lutherans <laughs> established their first church in 1844. So uh, this would be a whole other conversation to have around the ethnic European communities coming to Wisconsin bringing their Lutheran faith with them and how, how this tension that Dave presented of um, caring for the stranger or caring for our own people um, will continue to be alive and well. Uh, the Germans will conclave and the Norwegians will conclave and that will continue to be a part of our history. Um, so, so here we go then into 1948. We have um, our state established, and the first poor relief laws get passed in the state in 1849, a year later, right? So um, this is to care for anyone and everyone. And so now we have um, the government getting involved and taxing us to provide that. And Milwaukee is elsewhere in Wisconsin in the U.S. Indoor relief developed in the form of county poor houses, and you had one right in your backyard, the Alms House here in Wauwatosa. Uh, we're talking all that county grounds. Um, maybe, I bet some of you know more than I do. Um, this was established in 1852. They finally built a facility. I don't know what generation this structure really is, um, but this lodging was for Milwaukee's destitute. The, lang the language feels uh, really rough to me. Um, and and um, this home was quickly overwhelmed with the needy as this facility became a proverbial dumping ground for paupers, orphans, the infirm, and the mentally disabled. Okay, that's our state <laughs> trying to do something, right? Um, the spread of disease, <laughs> both in the city and the almshouse, grew the county's first hospital, and that opened in 1861, providing much needed medical care for the county's ill. And as you know, that facility continued to evolve over the years and, and became a, a pretty good facility. Um, if you're wondering, this was my favorite website. Um, it's uh, Milwaukee UWM, I can send you that link, but this is, I'm totally plagiarizing um, from their site. Um, Go ahead. That picture about the building uh, there, it's interesting, while that building is gone, what's there is the cemetery, yeah. which says 4,000 people were buried here uh, up from the poor and the paupers of that time. Thank you for that, Dave, and I understand there are numerous um, mass graves um, from that era, and boy, that would be an interesting, like, uh, Good Friday to just go around and uh, pray for those people and, and, I don't know, give thanks for that life. I'm going to uh, keep rolling because I know this is getting you interested. <laughs> um, and so there's the hospital. Um, we would move on to develop some things. I, I had heard it was Freighter Lutheran Hospital at one point, so I wanted to understand uh, the Lutheran part of it, but I realized this was just a good philanthropist. Um, Curtis R. Freydart. Freydart? How's my German? Freydart? He okay. was a Norwegian. He was? Well, now I'm really getting messed with. <laughs> well, I do know he made his money uh, with that grain and malt company, uh, which supplied to all our bearing industry locally. Um, he had his hands in lots of developments, all our malls. Um, May, um, Mayfair. What do you got, Mayfair? Mayfair. Uh, North, North. Ridge and South Ridge. He was all uh, part of those developments, huh. and he left 11 million dollars in 1951 
that a hospital would be um, formed. It went into a trust and of course took 30 years to develop that actually into Frederick Memorial Hospital. Um, I bet some of you know more about that, but I think this will be an interesting, could be a whole other conversation around um, the industrial um, owners and their philanthropy that supported so many things here in our, in our backyard. Yeah, well, yeah, that's another one. Um, here's another part of our area. Um, Milwaukee Hospital mm -hmm. was born, formed in 1863 on Kilbourne Avenue. We're talking about three miles from us. It, I was trying to understand there was supposedly this little hill. There's the old quote farmhouse. Um, Lutheran deaconesses, there would be another conversation, uh, came along, converted this farmhouse on a hill into a hospital for the poor. It grew and became a major urban hospital, then faced financial struggles that led to its closure in 1998. An important name behind that was William... Thank you, historians. Um, he is actually listed in our... Um, commemorative, not saints, but um, well, saints of God, uh, that we remember him. He is all over the place, um, forming hospitals and old people's homes, orphanages. He has a hand in uh, Anne's alma mater, Lutheran School of Theology, um, and um, really, uh, you can see, he was, he was the fundraiser. <laughs> he didn't have the funds, but I think uh, he must have been very persuasive uh, to um, see the need to provide institutions of care and uh, was able to really instigate that. Well, there was hope for that little uh, Milwaukee hospital. This is what I'm trying to understand now. It is called City on a Hill. It became a reality in 2000 like, thanks to a local ministry, I think the Pentecostal Church got in on this, a national relief organization and a gift of the property from Aurora Healthcare who had owned that hospital. Um, it just sounded like just a really beautiful story of seeing need in this neighborhood. Um, there was like this food drive and it led to just this outpouring of we need to start a whole new care ministry. Anyone familiar with City on a Hill? Okay, we're gonna come back to you and, and hear more from you. <laughs> but I, I thought that was just a beautiful um, story of revival and the intent of, of people of Christian faith uh, continuing to provide uh, care services in this neighborhood. Uh, not to forget St. Luke's Hospital, a little bit farther south, and, you know, starts as a doctor just wanting to prevent, and it's the whole development of medical care in and of itself, creates a little house of a hospital that soon gets purchased by the Lutheran Hospital Association, and I, I think Carl might know more of their story, but I, I, I wasn't real familiar with this Lutheran background. Um, and, but uh, as you know, they continue to build and rebuild and are, are still doing great work um, in our community. Beyond hospitals is the work of orphanages. Now we're going to give some head nods to our Roman Catholic uh, community. Um, 1848, right? At the same time uh, we became a state, um, the archbishop gets comes along and says we need to open an orphanage. And that what precipitates that is should just sound familiar. I read it, it was there was a cholera epidemic that precipitated this need to take care of these girls. And so an orphanage is formed that eventually becomes incorporated and acknowledged. Um, and here's that, um, that kind of take care of your own. Mostly it was girls of Irish and German immigrant backgrounds. Okay. Not to be left behind, St. Joseph comes along, they're over on 18th Street, and they um, are, decide the Polish community should also get in the act and uh, construct the St. Joseph's Orphanage and uh, continue to care for that. Oh, and at St. Rose too, they also had another influx following uh, the Civil War. And I'm like, I, it, it took me like 30 seconds to make that connection. Why, why would you need an orphanage support following a war? Well, 
the fathers, the fathers, the fathers are killed, the mothers can't take care of children, and probably the girls are the first you get rid of, was my guess. I don't know, you will, we'll have to leave that up for discussion. Um, the Lutherans also, interestingly, got into um, the orphanage work. Help me out, Dave. <laughs> the Evangelical Lutheran Kinder Freund, Freund? Society of Wisconsin. Um, orphanages in the Milwaukee area were so overcrowded that there were many homeless and dependent children who were not properly cared for, putting them at risk for bodily and spiritual harm. Pastors and laymen in the Milwaukee area saw the need for orphan, neglected, and dependent children to be cared for by Christian families instead of institutions, our first foster care system. Um, and so this was formed. Now, you, you can say that's great. Um, you know, some of the critiques could be this is just um, hired help, uh, or some could see this is um, a little more let's keep them in our own families so that you know you, you'll you'll stay in a Lutheran German home and learn a Ger Lutheran German uh, family so there's a little bit of that um, keeping to our own or it could just be a really creative um, wow willing to do <coughs> sort of a foster care idea um, they moved into uh, a site in 1923 on Harwood Avenue. Anyone know what might be existing on that location today? <laughs> Your home? Well, lo and behold, um, we had lunch <coughs> some weeks ago with a woman who was a social worker, and she was a social worker when Harwood was still an orphanage. Uh -huh. And she talked about the children she had placed there, kind of a fascinating historical experience. And it's now the Howard Place, the uh, senior living, independent living place mm -hmm. where Dan yeah. and Julia are you I, I actually worked in the kitchen of LCFS when it was an institution in the late 60s, or probably mid 60s. Um, I was a high school kid and just mm -hmm. worked there, and it was a very interesting experience. Well, you're dating. <laughs> yeah. I, I knew there would be genuine historians in the room. <coughs> yeah. So that was kind of our Lutheran presence in the orphanage that I could find in my hacking search. Um, not to forget our elder care, um, two facilities, I think, doing very well in our Wauwatosa community. Uh, Lutheran Home, um, established in 1906. Um, that lower building um, sounded much like the Roman Catholics. They needed to provide for their retired, and this language said, and indigent pastors and teachers <laughs> <laughs> who could live out their lives in relative comfort and dignity. And I, I just went, oh, that sounds like the ELCA. When I came into ministry, there was a big push for pensions and equity, equity for um, parsonage um, homes, that you would build up an equity so that when you retired, uh, many of us would have, a, have paid off a mortgage, you have a home, now you leave your parsonage, you have, you have no retirement support. Um, and so I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, they, they, you kick you up, you're out of the parsonage, where do you go? At least they're providing um, some support. That's, that's great. Called the Altenheim or um, elder care, elder home. Elder home. Thank you, the translators. Um, and grows into the Lutheran home. Um, 1960, Luther Manor comes on board, and that little picture of um, this soldier is Pastor Bill Downey from Fox Point Lutheran Church. Uh, he was a ringleader to get Luther um, Manor started. I found interesting in his obituary, um, he, uh, let's see, he was a chaplain who served during World War II, a chaplain of the 509th Composite Group. He prayed for the crew of the Enola Gay before they left from Tinian Island, 1945, on their mission to drop an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. Mm -hmm. After the war, he served as pastor at this church. 
Um, and I'm like going, 1960, let's see, this is when these veterans are aging and need care and support. I, I'm suspecting you know, that continued to be part of his passion to serve, serve veterans. Um, I'm guessing, maybe some of you know more of his story. But anyway, two elder care facilities. That so you know, the deaconesses, Lutheran deaconesses moved there. The Lutheran deaconesses moved to Luther Manor? That's how one of them, they had no place to go. They didn't serve in the church. Ah. Also retired pastors, a lot of them ended up there early. Okay, they were both similar kind of place for, for pastors and deaconesses. <coughs> Education, and of course, in our own backyard, Milwaukee Lutheran High School, Wisconsin Lutheran School, and Wisconsin Lutheran College, which is all part of this county grounds area that they were getting land. Any, any alumni from these institutions? All right. And um, Will, I think you shouted out, or Andy, our philanthropist? Siebert. Siebert. Oh, yes, Albert Siebert. Yep, yep, yep. He owned the Milwaukee Electric Tool Company, and he too left uh, an endowment um, that would continue to support um, churches and local Wisconsin Lutheran um, serving agencies. And so I, I worked thought, there for a year. You worked there for a year, okay. So you could tell his story. And they also gave a grant to JOMM, which packages food for families in need of food. Excellent, I, I think their, their support is lots of places. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go big. Lutheran so Services in America, um, of which um, uh, it's a nonprofit corporation coordination, the work of 300 people, independent Lutheran health and human service organizations <coughs> affiliated with ELCA and LCMS. In terms of res revenue, it is the single largest charitable organization in America. These organizations provide health and human services to over 6 million people throughout the U.S. and the Caribbean and estimates that in any given year, their program touches the lives of one in every five Ameri 50 Americans. Building upon the strengths of people and community, Lutheran social ministry organizations address a wide range of needs, including those of the elderly, children, families, people with special needs, prisoners, people with disabilities, and providing disaster response. Although Lutheran Services in America was established in 1997, it continues the one and a half century practice of organized Lutheran's efforts to serve those in need. Many of these social ministry organizations were established in the mid 19th century as hospitals and orphanages. And that's right from their website. Um, I, I just, I thought we're going big, you know, so that's cool. And, but I want to come back to, for me, is the questions. With all this specialization, where, what role does the church, or we who gather in the community of the church, I, I'm struggling with um, being proud of the specialization of these institutions, and then struggling with the intersection that we as just common, ordinary Christian, how do we um, connect with that and participate in that? Um, that's my question. How do we cross paths with a person who lies in the hospital and the, strange, the strangers come to minister to them? Um, you know, we, we can, we do, but it, but it becomes uh, when sometimes we recognize in the church our best gift is the coffee hour fellowship when we check in and say, how you doing? And hear about your highs and lows and share that gift of listening and caring. How do we bring that to the places we serve? Um, when the household used to be um, the place where the church began, where we were um, practicing all that scripture and Jesus taught us, and now today the household is smaller and more private, where then do we intersect if it's not in our homes, then where, where are the intersections with strangers and our neighbor and where hospitality is practiced? Um, we applaud the government funding of our institutions 
and yet uh, wonder what role does our personal hospitality uh, serve in all of this. So that's where I'm handing it over to you for your comments, your corrections, and your questions. I, I'd like to uh, focus on two different things of hospitality. You mentioned um, orphanages. 105 years ago, and the people of Armenia still honor the people of Cyprus today. Over 100, about 105 years ago, over a million Armenians were slaughtered. And the people of Cyprus built uh, orphanages to care for the children of those families. And they're still honored by the Armenians today for what I call Christ-like hospitality. And today, you see people in Poland and Germany holding signs at railway stations. I have two rooms in my home. They're taking in the uh, Armenia, uh, the um, Ukrainian refugees, mm -hmm. caring for them, feeding them, and yeah. this is Christ-like hospitality. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Don. So yeah. we're seeing, we're seeing, and that, and that's that's the you know, the Pol the Polish people extending the gift of hospitality to stranger to their neighbor. Yeah, and and they're poor and they can't really afford like. Yeah. You know, yep. if we could do that, if they could come here, I'm sure people in this country would do the same. Throughout this, I keep thinking of the word charity, and I'm wondering how, I think that as a whole, we're kind of moving away from like, oh, let's do charity work, like giving to these people who need this help. But then I also wonder where the difference between hospitality and just charity is, so kind of along with that. In my household, I've heard like, why is there why are there people who are unhoused in America when most homes have at least one spare room? So yeah. I'm just challenged by, like you said, being proud of work and hospitality that has taken place, but then where are those intersections where we care for each other before folks are in systems, before they're in institutions, and then say, oh, it's good you're here, now we can care for you. Mm -hmm. um, where are the opportunities before that? Have you thought of any answers? It's just, a, it's on a struggle. It, it, it really is. Yeah, and I think of hospitality at an arm's length. So it's okay to care for you as long as you aren't in my home or in my community. Like, I can come and care for you, but that challenge of welcoming into shared space. Yeah, the, this theme, and as you'll hear hopefully in the Wednesday video, is to think about hospitality requires a risk on our part. Um, and, and, and some are too big of a risk, um, but we have to figure out where, how far can we push ourselves to take a little risk. Go ahead, Anne. But along with that, like uh, the alms house and the orphanages and the county grounds, that was like kind of outside, like that was far away from the city, right? So yeah. we're going to build this place for people who are mentally ill or indigent or whatever, but it's going to be way over here. Like now it's in the middle of Wauwatosa and the freighter <laughs> medical system and everything, but I think at the time it was kind of... Yeah, so that was going on back then, just push the problems away, shove them out to the edge of town. Yeah. Well, Carl? I think one of the most difficult things in our culture and our society is we don't hear Luther's concept of holy calling or vocation. In other words, he said a shoemaker does as important work as I do preaching if he makes a good pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. So as our people go out working in hospitals or working in commerce, they are witnessing the hospitality, seeing a child of God and the people they deal with. You yeah, know what I'm absolutely. Saying? That's where Luther broke down the walls of the separation between the religious and regular people. Right, right, yeah. Well, and I, I want to be a little hopeful. I, I think one of the things I applaud of St. Matthew's is the many, um, so you partner with serving agencies. So we're going to bring a meal that you, you're you running the, the program and you're dealing with people. But the invitation then is to say, are we just dropping the food off? Or is there a chance to be there and say hello and to greet um, greet the people that you are? So that it isn't, char charity has a kind of a sense of, um, up down that I'm looking down on someone and I'm providing you but 
um, partnership uses that language of I have so much to receive by offering this gift of hospitality and the gift of hospitality is simply recognizing a person saying hello and how's your day doing and you know you walk away feeling blessed for that interaction with a stranger so i i i, I want to say those are definitely intersection places where you put yourself um so like reformation is going to do a good friday walk in the neighborhood and we're just going to join together as community and see what's going on in their backyard and, and learn from them of the highs and lows i mean so these these place opportunities are there for us it's just a common um, christian wanting to practice hospitality and i think is to take the risk to join in and do some of that and i know a number of you have been in those places and and can testify to what a blessing that is other thoughts yeah, well I, go for it you well, i was kind of agree, uh, agreeing as it relates to hospitality and the whole story of the strangers knock at midnight you know it's uncomfortable in certain cases and uh, I like what you said as it relates to you know uh, the deal of serving food to an inner city church just dropping it off without knowing the people or without interchanging or without getting uncomfortable in terms of you know this is how we're going to engage in an environment a culture that we're not familiar with can you imagine the owner of the house answering the knock at midnight like who is this person what do they want you know with with me so uh I've, yeah I've, I've, i like your words yeah you know, it, yeah it, it's just a part of uncomfortability like the and, 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 that, and that's okay um I, I have a friend who um got talked into it by his business partners to do a coat drive collection. And he's like, okay, yeah, yeah, let's load up the back of our cars and drop them off. And on the way there, his friend said, yeah, um, there, there's you know kids here that are gonna get coats, you should be, in it. and my friend just went, there's kids in there? And he broke down crying. I mean, that, that, that had crossed some line and, and the tears of compassion were appropriate. But, but we all have kind of that breaking point of, um, but, but if we shut that emotion off, that compassion and that care and, and don't want to be hurt and don't want to be troubled by the world's um, challenges, um, you know, that, that, that's the intersection that we're called to live in. And, and we all have our own place where, where that is. To speaking of intersections, where we lived in Austin, we were confronted with this every time we drove down the street because the climate is so marvelous there that the, the, the homeless descend on Austin and they're always there when you come to a stoplight waiting for a handout. And I have not found that to be true in Wisconsin except at Walgreens drugstores. Yeah. <laughs> there are from time to time when I've gone in various Walgreens drugstores there's somebody standing there waiting for a handout. And and that's particularly scary at evening sure. or night if well, you know, sure. if you're approached. Um, but in Austin, the church that my husband referenced, we had the, they had a ministry where you bought a pair of men's socks mm -hmm. and you stuffed one in the toe of the other, and then you put a water bottle and some uh, health bars or whatever. And so you carry the people, members of the congregation, put those in their cars so that when you were in a situation, somebody wanted a handout, you offered that. Uh, but that is a challenge for me when I okay. am confronted at a grocery or at a Walgreens pharmacy uh, for somebody asking me for, That's tough. for something. It is tough when we yeah. cross it. I, do I feel safe? Yeah. You know, is my life being threatened or my possessions? Yeah. Other thoughts? I, when I was a child, we grew up on a farm and there were 10 kids. And there was hardly enough food to feed the 10 of us sometimes. And I recall what we termed hobos. <laughs> coming to the door, rapping on the door, and my mother would sit out a plate of food. Yeah. That was hospitality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
remember Tanzanians came um, to visit. I'm out in a con walk, show them the tour, the, the free clinic, show them the food pantry, and they're just puzzling, going, you mean if someone has needs food, they can't just go to their neighbor? <laughs> <coughs> And boy, it, I still just struggle with that. Um, there's lots of reasons behind that. I do have to say, as a new member or coming into St. Matthew's for the first time as it relates to hospitality, you guys have your ushering down, and I can tell you also in your mission statements, or I know that you're doing a call and it's who we are. I do have you. You guys are right on the mark with your members approaching quote unquote strangers or new people and introducing themselves and uh, inviting them and all. So you guys, uh, in terms of uh, pat on the back, you guys have that skill, you have that talent as it relates to people welcoming and uh, making them feel welcome at, uh, at, 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 at their place. So you guys have that marked out. Well, good, good, I'm glad you <laughs> experienced that. that. Yeah. But we're trying to take it one step further, right? And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and having, you know, people feel welcome uh, and not just on the surface, but, sure. but, but break, making a, a deeper relationship as well. Right? I was talking to uh, one of my brothers who, you know, we grew up in a Lutheran church and he's maybe agnostic at best, married a Roman Catholic, and I. I was, I was, <laughs> does that say a lot? I don't know. His excuse to stay out of it. But, but I, I, I was, I was telling him that, um, that this church is, you know, looking at new pastors and interviewing and, and um, they're recognizing in, in the clergy now a lot more LGBTQ candidates because I think they're drawn to a community that says, here's a place you're accepted. And, and I was telling him that the church is really, trying to practice a welcome to all people and he says now that sounds like a church i'd like to be a part of and i <laughs> just was it's the strangest family conversation <laughs> <laughs> i'll have to send them some elca church <laughs> yeah i'm involved in an article that uh, documents the fact that there were once 80 lutheran hospitals in the united states <clears throat> surprising to many people of all different denominations, and those have um, basically disappeared, being bought up by larger corporations like Ascension and Advocate and uh, Aurora and so forth. <clears throat> Sometimes they continue to allow the name, like Advocate uh, Lutheran General uh, in Park Ridge. They, they maintain that name, but for the most part, that name has disappeared. So I think a conversation like this, a discussion like this is useful because it helps us to um, respect the theological and psychological identity that we have with hospitality. If you ask um, the secular world why they provide food for the hungry and clothing for uh, the poor and, and, and whatever, and the secular world's doing it in abundance, I'd be interested in the answer to the question, you know, because we're all humans or, or whatever. I mean, our identity as Christians says uh, we do this because we see in Jesus, we see in the stranger, Jesus. Uh, that, that's our, our challenge. Uh, and it's good to, to remember that uh, the roots of our identity. Yeah. I think I'm going to leave you with the last word, Dave. Our time is up. i got to go to worship. But if you uh, <laughs> be hospitable to each other, please do. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, David.